Do you have a window nearby? I do, but I don't happen to be on Gotland at ah. the moment. <laughs> if I were in the back office in the main town of Visby, I would be able to see the ruin of St. Catherine, a Franciscan monastery from the 13th century, because Visby is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it's, you know, lots of medieval architecture, and that's what I would be looking out onto in our main square, where our office is. Välkommen. Välkommen. Tervetuloa. Välkommen. 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 Welcome to Testing Grounds from the Nordic Alliance of Artists' Residencies on Climate Action. Episode 4, Baltic Art Centre. What's the role of artists in an age of climate crisis? The Nordic Alliance of Artists' Residencies on Climate Action, or NARCA, is a network of seven artists' residencies across the Nordic region and Scotland. They've come together to explore what potential artists' residencies have to be testing grounds, testing grounds for new ways of living and working that are ecologically, socially, mentally, and financially sustainable. I'm Katie Revel. In this series, I'm talking to people in and around the Narca residencies about the themes, the challenges, and the questions they're grappling with that we're all grappling with in the context of the climate crisis. In this episode, we're visiting Narka's Swedish partner, Baltic Art Centre. My name is Helena Selder and I'm the Artistic Director of BAC, or Baltic Art Centre, which is our full name. And we're an international residency for contemporary visual art based on Gotland, a Swedish island in the middle of the Baltic Sea. BAC is based in Visby, Gotland's main town. It's a small medieval, we say, Hansa city. You know, it's from the time of the Hansa Trade League and it's lots of medieval architecture, but it's a mix also. It's a small town. I think it's not more than like 6,000 people living inside the walls because it's a walled medieval city. And then it has a sort of sprawling kind of residency buildings and all kinds of buildings outside the walls. It's very cozy and it has lots of tourists during the warm season and it's a lot more quiet during the cold season, if you say. So it has a sort of sleepy time and a more very active, bustling time during the summer. And what about Gotland more generally? What sort of a place is it? It's a very well-known place in Sweden because it's the biggest island we have off the Swedish coast. It's known for its dramatic landscape. It's made up of limestone, so it has a very sort of special rocky landscape. It's also known because there is a small island attached to the bigger island, Fåre, where the Swedish director Ingmar Bergman used to live. So it's associated with beautiful landscapes, history, lots of heritage, and I guess summer tourism. <laughs> what are some of the ways that the climate crisis is impacting Gotland? Well, one important thing is the water shortage on the island, which is climate related with um, the climate changing in such a way that weather has become more extreme. For example, you have longer period of droughts or periods of intense rain. And so for many places where there is agriculture, for centuries people have been creating arable land out of, for example, wetlands. So there is a system of trenches all over the island. So whenever it rains, a lot of it sort of flows off of the island to, to not swamp the, the fields. So that's a historic reason for why you get grass on places like this. But it's also because there is industry on the island that uses intense amounts of water. For example, there's the biggest concrete factory in Sweden is located on Gotland. And they use an immense amount of water just to produce the concrete, but they also extract limestone 
and the extraction itself affects the groundwater. Like if you drill into the ground here, you will lead groundwater to the holes you're making. So you are redirecting groundwater, which can have the effect that you are draining another bit of land that you didn't really expect. So there's been a number of conflicts around that with activists joining forces to stop new limestone quarries on the islands, etc. Are the water shortages something that you notice or is it more an issue for agriculture? When you arrive in the ferry terminal on Gotland, it says, please don't use too much water (laughs) while you're on the island or be careful with the water. And there is a watering ban most years since I've been on Gotland. From April, you cannot wash your car or fill a pool or it's quite detailed. Also, I've heard about people drilling for water when they actually enter in pockets of groundwater, which could be millions of years old. (laughs) So that's a very special thing that you have to try to find new water for your home. During 2018, there was a long period of drought during the summer. And I remember the farmers at the end of the summer had to buy water because their wells had gone dry. And that led to that a lot of farmers had to kill their animals. I know that there are farmers on southern Gotland having these desalination plants where they can desalinate the water from the ocean. They lower the pressure in the water system so that there's less pressure basically when you shower and you use less. So it is an issue that does enter into your daily life, yes. Can you just tell us a bit about Baltic Art Centre? Yeah, so Baltic Art Centre was founded in 1999 and it opened an art space in 2001 and it was funded by the region of Gotland and the Swedish Arts Council and they were really keen for Gotland to have this sort of contemporary art space to open up the island and to create like a meeting place. We transformed into a residency in 2007 or 8. From the beginning in the art space, they had something called production in residence, and that meant that they would invite artists who could propose a new artwork. And we sort of kept that strand in our program. So we usually say that we are a project and production-based residency. So we're not so focused on artists coming to stay for a certain amount of time we focus on making a project together and that means that artists may come and go actually over a longer period of time back is a very small organization sort of staff wise we're only two people and we have offices and a guest apartment in Visby and then we actually use all of the island as a studio. We have a, an old car that we use and let the artist uh, use to drive around the island. Most of the cases, they're interested in connecting to, to the landscape of the island, to the history, to different kinds of people, organizations and such. So that's what we try to facilitate their process on Gotland. And it's also where we see that the exchange in between Gotland as a location and the international artist community happens. It's when they do their research. We don't always present things on Gotland. Sometimes the process itself is enough. I have the impression that a big part of Bach's work is making links not only with artists, but between different organisations, different institutions. For example, through the grass fellows program and I just wanted to ask a little bit about that about that focus on collaboration and why that's important it has to do what I was saying just now uh, that that's how the artist exchange with the island so creating these collaborations with organizations like Uppsala University's graduate school on sustainability studies which is housed on campus Gotland is very important for us it means that we can create sort of a base for exchange And we have several collaborations like that, for example, with the Gotland Museum. But with the one 
with GRAS, which is the acronym for Graduate School on Sustainability Studies, we started together the GRAS Fellow Program. Together, we invite artists to exchange with a research environment and also some of the master programs that, that are focused on sustainability. So we invite artists that have a particular focus on sustainability issues to establish and develop new relationships and ways of working in this environment on campus. And we also try to use our grass fellows to draw out the research students out of their normal environment. So we do excursions and workshops, and we've also been trying to do sort of one-on-one -on -one meetings in between artists and the graduate students. So that's an important context for us also to locate our NORCA partnership in. On that note, why then did Baltic Art Centre want to be part of NARCA? How did that come about? Well, I guess you could say we already had a sort of climate conscious program in the sense that we were inviting artists to back to work with artistic projects related to climate and climate action, for example, through the Grass Fellow program. But actually, we were very often contacted by artists who were interested in these issues and wanted to come to back and take part of the program because the climate crisis is showing its effect on Gotland locally. So we were doing that, but NARCA does provide a context where we can critically reflect on sustainability of our residency practice. So it's a great context to have colleagues to do that with and to analyze how we work and not only our emissions, but other sort of uh, sustainability issues. So that's basically the opportunity to develop our residency and be part of the transformation of our organization. What would you say is your own motivation for working on these issues? I guess mild panic <laughs> <laughs> and not so mild always. Yeah, I'm like everybody else. I'm worried. And what can you do? And for me, I guess working with the Grass Fellow Program and working with NARCA is a way of dealing with those feelings. What is it that I'm already doing that is uh, productive? What is not productive? What is, you know, damaging? It's uh, good to know that you're doing something and good to find out more things you can do. It helps. And I'm also trying to see how our discussions and findings can circulate in my other networks. So it's also something good that is knowledge that can spread. Something we've been talking about a long time is to try to have artists stay longer, and that would change how we organize the residency itself. So it's a very practical outcome, I think. The discussions we've had and the toolkit we're developing within the partnership is also helping us to realize what we're already doing, for example, in terms of raising the issues through our program. So there's the possibility to reflect on what we're doing is what we want to get out of it. And it feels like it's already happening and it's going to change our program, I think. For this episode, our guests are Rika Luder and Nomeda and Gadaminas Urbonis. They'll be exploring what role artists can and should play in an age of climate crisis, what kinds of opportunities artists have in this context and what responsibilities they have as well. Could you just introduce us to our contributors for this episode? To put it simply, both Nomeda and Gediminas Urbunas, who work together as Urbuna Studio and Ricky Luther, they both work with projects relating to water or environments that depend on or are affected by water. So this, of course, interests us at Bach since there is this water scarcity on Gotland that gets more and more urgent. So that's a sort of common denominator, I guess. Ricky Luther is a Danish artist and researcher whose uh, artistic work explores new relations created by environmental crisis. And Narka has commissioned a new work from her, a project that bears the name More Mud, that examines the new mudscapes that are developing as the planet heats and thaws. So she's developing the project in dialogue with the NARCA partners, also by making research trips to our locations. 
And some of them are really affected by these mudscapes, for example, Iceland that have had serious landslides. Other places like Gotland are affected by how the climate affects the oceans surrounding us. So uh, she has different sort of ways of touching on the, the water issue, you could say. And more mud is also part of a bigger research project that Rika is working with called the Ocean Lands Mud Within the Earth System. Rika is actually our grass fellow right now, and she spent time at BAC during the fall in October, where she visited BAC and she did workshops and a lecture about her work, but she also did research and went to see different people and researchers on the island. So we, she was doing both uh, being a, a grass fellow at the same time making research for her NARCA project, the More Mud project. And she's going to come back because she actually got caught in a blizzard when she was on Gotland in October, which is also talking about climate change. It is not normal for a snow blizzard to happen in October. So a lot of that research that she wanted to make, which is how the ocean meets the land on Gotland, she couldn't even come to the coast because of the snow. So she's coming in September, we think, we hope to do this uh, more marine research. Nomeda and Gediminas are artists, researchers and educators that for many years have worked with the wetland as both a biological concept and as an environment. And the way they see it, wetlands can be seen as a model, a model of coexistence between all the life forms that inhabit it. And it's a model that we humans can learn from in their view. And in collaboration with the Public Art Agency in Sweden, we commissioned them a public art project as a part of a planning scheme for a field in a new city district in Gotland's main town, Visby. And this field that they developed the work for was meant to be converted into a stormwater pond to take care of excess rainwater. So the field that they were working in would be you could say, turned into a wetland during certain periods of the year. And the artist created a digital tool called the Swamp Observatory. It was basically an augmented reality app that enriched this field with imaginary sort of future species or monsters, as the artist preferred to call them. And the project was meant to inspire thoughts about the importance of the lost wetlands of Gotland and the recovery in a time of yeah, global climate change. So that's why I thought they would be interesting to talk to as they work with water in so many different ways, which is a big issue on Gotland. Hello, my name is Nomad Urbanas. And my name is Gedi Minas. We are artists, originally coming from Lithuania, but now we live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We have collaborative practice and we are researchers at MIT, where I am an associate professor at Art, Culture and Technology program, and Nomad is research affiliate. And for the Past years, we've been working with a new initiative at MIT that is called Climate Visions. I'm Rebecca Luther, and I have a background in fine art. My postdoc is based at the Rock Center, the Research Social Climate and Society, under a professor in oceanography, Katrin Richardson. And then I'm sitting at the Center for Macroecology, Evolution and Climate at the University in Copenhagen. So it had very different links and interconnections, the work I'm working on for NACA. It will mainly be a film, and I'm also doing some larger maps. And through the project, there will be exhibitions, and then my postdoc will also end in a publication. I wanted to ask a bit about the projects that I guess are most related to your time on Gotland, Nomed and Gediminas, if you could start by telling us a bit about the Swamp Observatory project. Yes, we started the Swamp Observatory project by the invitation of BAC, which was actually a very interesting collaboration with the region of Gotland. And later also the public art agency Sweden joined the project. 
This is a project which involves artists in the very beginning of the planning process of the future sustainable city called Visborg. It's a suburbs, you could say, of Visborg. And it is a former army base. And now this territory will be like replanted and regenerated for the needs of the community. As part of this regeneration, the planners were suggesting rain water ponds that would function as a sponges to receive the water during the floods and release it during the droughts. So invitation to the artist came in this early stage of the planning. So the artist could suggest the ways how the planners could perhaps rethink their position. As artists, we are very much interested in destabilizing certain habits of thought. So Swamp Observatory had a role to imagine ecologies that are not yet on site, things that are invisible to human eye or maybe even cannot be detected by the human sensorial apparatus, by hearing or by vision but could already be imagined, you know, as taking place in the future. That's how we came up with the idea of the observatory as a specific sensorial instrumentarium that could help us to imagine future ecologies. And perhaps by that imagination, hypothetically, we could say, set what we are calling the environmental citizenship. The Swamp Observatory is an augmented reality environment It's accessed through an app that people can use on their phones or computers. Together with students from a local school, the Athene School, Urbuna Studio created a menagerie of future species, weird and wonderful imaginary creatures that the proposed stormwater ponds might create a home for. By scanning QR codes, visitors to the site can see these creatures, learn about them and follow them around the landscape. The augmented reality environment has five different scenes or moods, and each mood has its own soundscape. The one we're hearing right now is called Methane Cloud. The sound design is by the German electronic duo Mouse on Mars, using audio samples created by the students. Were there any stipulations about what your involvement had to look like, or was it quite an open invitation? It was an open invitation, but of course they were thinking of a certain subjects and themes which were important for the region, for the planners, perhaps also for the developers. So there were like three themes what they proposed. And those were mobility, identity and ecology. So they invited local artists from Gotland, also the Swedish artists, and then the international artists. So each of us, we could choose one of these areas and then make a proposal in the first stage. And then in the second stage, we got a public Mm -hmm. art agency of Sweden joining the project and further funding it towards the realization. So the invitation came end of uh, 2019, beginning of 2020, we visited the site And then the COVID started. So basically, we had to develop all the projects remotely without actually visiting the site. Maybe also interesting detail is that the invitation came just for a project proposal. So the initial idea was like really to make a research, to like think freely, to imagine and not think about the outcome or actually rather not think about the realization of the project. And that was a condition. And also, I remember like very (laughs) vividly that the planners, they said like, no, 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 there are no promises what your project will be realized. So, you know, we could have like relax and just like think what it would be like, what we would like to do. And I have to say that in Sweden, they have quite a radical, if not revolutionary approach when it comes to engagement of artists to planning. So this project also had this characteristic, given that artists were approached even before the planning took place. So the discussion, the engagement of the artists with the planners in the region, with public administration, with landscape architects, with all the researchers that are thinking how this territory could be approached, 
was really exemplary in the sense because artists could really set a way how the planners could think about engaging their territory, engaging its ecologies, engaging the land. And engaging the people or communities, a particular communities perhaps. Yeah, that's so interesting. I was talking to someone just yesterday actually about that question of engagement and what role artists can play I mean, I'm not an artist myself, but I have friends who are, and a lot of them, I think, would describe themselves as community-engaged artists. But I think a lot of the time it feels like getting the artist involved for community engagement is a bit of a side project, or it's kind of a box that gets ticked, Mm -hmm. but it's not clear how it actually feeds in to the direction of the project. So yeah, it's really interesting to hear about a context in which the artists are actually really integral. And as you say, they're there right at the start. It's not a kind of an afterthought. Yeah, yeah exactly. Artists are not invited to sort of like repair the damage that is done yeah. by the planners. Yeah, know, yeah. or beautify. They, right. Yeah, you know, because uh, we know so many cases when artists are called to mitigate, let's say, acoustics in the urban domain because the planners, you know, they didn't take into consideration maybe acoustic elements, you know, and so on and so forth. So in this instance, that was really characteristic that artists were called right in the beginning to sort of like sit down together and think about the ways how the planning can be reapproached, recombined, and reimagined from the outset. Rika, could you tell us a bit about what you're working on and especially how that relates to the time that you spent on Gotland and the time that you're planning to spend there again? My main work for the Narka project is this film. And it relates to mainly mud. So the outtake is ocean lands, mud within the earth system. And that means that I'm looking at the ocean and the land and the interaction with these two elements, including atmosphere. So Gotland is a part of the larger project where I have been examining mudscapes or sediments on the east side of Iceland. And then I'm going to Greenland and Svalbard, and then also I'll be here in Denmark. And then Gotland, my former work was based on concrete, and they said, oh, there's all this chalk in Gotland. It's more or less chalk that's related to concrete production. And there's a big problem with the mining in Gotland because it means that the water level is getting lower, It includes that there's a lot of plant biodiversity that's being changed, that's dying out. It also includes that the salt water is getting in to the island. So that was things I found out when I was invited to Gotland. And when I came there, then I started to talk to scientists and local people that's related to these questions. And then I thought, since it's not so muddy in Gotland, it would be more trying to form an image of the ocean space because Gotland is very old seabed that have been pushed up. So it's a very specific site in relation to that. So Gotland would be very much about the deep time description of the planet in relation to the ocean use it as a spot to try to talk about the historical changes in the ocean land relation. That's where I am right now with Gotland. So it had been very much meeting different kind of people there and just being out in the landscape filming and reading. That's very much how I work. I have a very, very strict abstract and I really stick to the abstract. (laughs) But from there, I have no idea where I'm going. I find that in some ways a terrifying thought and in some ways an absolutely thrilling thought. The idea of being able to dive in to a project and just see where it takes you seems like such a joy. It is, but on the other hand, the thing I just have met recently, also when I was in Iceland and talked to a scientist there, they worked for many years, but they are in year zero. Everything is uncertain and it's such a new land for the researchers as well. So I'm absolutely not alone with these questions, what is this and what is this new landscape?
it seems that the work that you're doing takes quite different approaches, but a commonality, I think, is that you're all engaging in your work with climate, earth systems, landscapes, the relationship between our human systems and what we might call natural systems. And yeah, I'm curious to know why. Why are you all motivated to engage with these themes? Quite often we get this question from people like, what is the most important subject now to work with? So in a way, you know, we think, of course, like climate crisis is the most important subject. Of course, there is a war going on and there are like, you know, inequalities within the human society, you know, human species, let's say, which is also very important, you know, things to address. But somehow like climate crisis is the overarching I think, subject of the time. And, you know, it is like something what we feel we have to like respond to in a way and engage with. For the past seven years or so, we've been very much engaged in swamps, not only as a very important biosphere, but also as a metaphor and also as a notion that historically was irritant to humans, also to modernity. And especially it came apparent during the political campaign in 2016, you know, with this notorious slogan, drain the swamp. So our work on one hand really sort of like attempted to rehabilitate the swamp. We got interested why in culturally during the many historic epochs in many geographical destinations, swamps would be compared with the wasteland, with hell even. And meanwhile, discussing either with botanists or with pedologists, you know, people who are experts of the soil, hydrologists, and so on and so forth, you know, with planetary sciences. Swamps are recognized as very important ecosystems whose contribution to making of the planetary good, so to speak, even exceeds the tropical forest in terms of the carbon sink, in terms of the methane lock, and so on and so forth. So this became kind of driving force for our work through the artistic practice and through artistic work, how we could contribute to unlocking and entangling certain habits of thought of the modernist mind, where the swamps are considered, you know, the unuseful, dirty um, terrain. So we set up Swamp School in 2018 as a contribution to Venice Bernale. We proposed curatorial vision for the Lithuania National Pavilion. And within that effort, we wanted to bring artists and philosophers and architects, so definitely addressing architecture education, from the hybrid perspective, arguing how important it is to address hybrid practices, also how important it is to learn from the environment, to learn from the swamp itself, where the swamp itself could become a classroom. So we brought students from dozen schools around the world to to actually middle of the lagoon and proposing them listening to the swamp and also thinking of the different materialities emerging out of what we call swampian pedagogy and swampian imagination. The um, argument there was that the swamp could become a lens through which we can look into complexities of today's world and even into such a wicked problem as a climate crisis. So within that effort, drawing a lot of inspiration from the 60s, cyberneticians such as Gordon Pask and Stafford Beer, who were researching ponds, and here maybe we are extending this into the swamps, as they try to imagine uh, future models for the biological computers where the human and the man-made environment could be coupled with the natural environment. So, so the natural environments using the feedback loops could hypothetically solve the mess and the issues that humans were making. So this legacy of this 60s experimental cybernetics found a way into how we're trying to organize the Swamp School back in 2018. And that gave us so much inspiration also to continue the work further into the experimentation with artificial intelligence, what we're calling Swamp Intelligence. We try to, again, like destabilize all the discussion about artificial intelligence by proposing Swamp Intelligence. 
This is the soundtrack to another one of the Swamp Observatory's five moods. This one's called Sulphur Swarm. Rika, you have already, I think, explained your reason for focusing on mud and your fascination with that. But maybe more broadly, where does your interest in earth systems come from as an artist, as a researcher? I think it always been there in some way. I worked in two other groups before I started to work for myself in 55 Learning Site. And we always had that element in it. I mean, we also have looked a lot on urban spaces. I built some constructions in adobe bricks with mycelium, so the mushrooms were breaking down the dwellings. And then 55, we did a hydroponic and we did fish farm and we built a floating island. I lived on the border, I think that was in 10. And that day, Manhattan was flooded. My house was standing on the seabed. So this feeling of the ocean and how it moves and how I'm part of it. So I've been for a very long time really wanted to go into the ocean, but I have not found out how to get there. And then in my PhD thesis, I got sidetracked into sand and sand extraction and the conflict that is a limited resource. And at that time, there was hardly no research on on sand. So I, I wrote a paper in August 17, and then I found some research in Leipzig, and I saw they've done a paper, and, and I was, oh, can I have it? No, you can first have it the 7th of September. It will be out in nature. And then I read, well, that's so much the same we've been writing. I think that scared me a little, <laughs> that me as this artist could more or less do similar things that came out in nature. That means that there's pretty limited knowledge about it. And that paper was the base for a project that called The Sandbag. I did for Wobunas' invitation to MIT. And then suddenly I was out into resources in a new way. So it always been that what is it, the material I'm working with? How is the relation to the society and where it comes from? So I think it had always been there, but then I've gone more and more into not the urban landscape, but the landscape more general. So I see myself as this landscape artist. And since the landscape have changed, then my work is following that. So it's not so much me that wanted to work on that. It's just the world had changed. So when I describe the world, then that's it. This next question is also something that you've all touched on. But to focus on it a bit more specifically, I mean, we can also debate this term climate crisis, whether it's adequate or appropriate or whatever. But for the sake of this question, how do you understand your role as artists in the context of the climate crisis? Do you have a responsibility to be engaging with the crisis in your work? Or is that idea of responsibility a bit problematic? I don't even see it as a question. It's just there. And the same with the biodiversity. I think as perhaps any challenge, you know, we should also approach this dialectically. You know, there are these two sides of this challenge, I would say. And of course, you know, we can say it is problematic because, well, we could say that neoliberal capitalism almost like, you know, puts the pressure on the artists and other creators to resolve issues, you know, and basically to clean all the mess, right? And another aspect of this challenge, you know, comes that how the artists are dealing with the question of problem solving, which is perhaps more characteristic to engineers' mind, you know? And here there is always the question like, okay, how effective then artistic problem solving could be to compare with the one of the engineers. But on the other hand, perhaps we could also say that in our work, we've been interested in the certain legacies of artistic practice. And those are having the starting point in constructivism sort of like opposed to bourgeoisie artists, you know, we could say the constructivist artists try to bridge the life practice with artistic practice, you know, so develop something that is called praxis. And I think also this is what we also understand in Rika's work as well, 
So yeah, there are these grand challenges, as Lameda was also referring earlier, you know, whether we're talking about inequalities, whether we're talking about many other things that constitute this uncertain future. I think artists have a great role contributing to that precisely with this kind of like dialectic approach that is different than engineers' problem-solving approach because this dialectic approach always suggests some paradoxical model. On one hand, we can say it engages with the problem-solving, but on the other hand, it proposes a different type of perspective. And this tension between the two is something that has very powerful effect for the imagination of the people. I totally agree with you, Gediminas, in this point. Maybe my like genealogy of my thinking is like slightly different because as I remember myself from the very beginning of my artistic practice, I would always try to like question the the idea of the artist as genius, as somehow exceptional, as in a way like a modern kind of modernist figure. And in that sense, I would say like artists is no different from the other, you know, like professional <laughs> groups of the society. So in that sense, like artist is in a way also responsible for, you know, what is happening with the climate and what is happening around us, you know, like equally responsible as all the other, you know, people around us and all the other professionals around us. So I think it is a responsibility of everyone. But then there is another part of me which, I don't know, looks at Kepesh, for example, yeah, Georgi Kepesh, who said, like, oh, artist is a seismograph. He's like a, a very sensitive, in a way, instrument which senses the problem maybe earlier than the other, you know, other people around. I really agree on, on that. That's what the artist can do that you can sense what is happening without really knowing what's happening uh, so to mm -hmm. say because that's what i've met in, in my recent work i come and ask these questions and say yes we're looking at it but we can't tell yet so many people are sensing this and it's in many different fields but we're doing it very different and i think what artists then can do is to make this wider image and try to build, for instance, a new ethical and aesthetic public language that's capable of commuting the crisis, for instance, within the Earth system in this situation. Which brings us on quite nicely, actually, to something else that I wanted to ask, which is very much related, but which is, what kind of engagement do you hope that people have with your work? Rika, something that you said, I think, in the presentation you gave to the NARCA group, you said something along the lines of you're not working to reach the public. Could you maybe explain what you meant by that and what you didn't mean by that? Oh, I didn't mean that. <laughs> it's not that I don't care about the public. Yeah. I, I think it's more that I enter a terrain and I simply do not know what's coming out of it mm. when I'm doing that. I have to try to understand what this is and from there then I have to create an output. So it's more in relation to the output then you start to have this idea about who's the audience. So I think I more mean I cannot form the audience. It is the work I'm sending out. It's very much up to the audience what they do with the work. I can shortly say that, you know, like the biggest satisfaction so far, in a way, I get from the situation when those people who are engaged in our projects take over the project. And continue, you know, as if this would be like their own thing. And this was happening like, you know, many times throughout our practice. So I think this is like the, you know, the best recognition in a way of what we do. If this is something what, you know, is needed by the others. So I think this is like the best recognition. Can I ask specifically actually about the work that you did on Gotland with the app and specifically the collaboration with the school children? Mm -hmm. Why did you want to do that and how was the experience? Well, the reason why we engaged the children, first of all, we know how the engaged and also we could say revolutionary young generation of Greta Thunberg is in Sweden. 
and thinking of the future development of the future city that argues itself as a sustainable city, we thought that we should bring to the discussion the coming generation. So those who actually already live on site and they go into the school on site, so they are familiar, we could say we decide that maybe there are some invisible things on site that they are not aware and we are not aware. You know, So we wanted to bring them into dialogue so we all could figure out what are those invisible things that constituting this, what we're calling shadow biosphere, which is emergent hypothesis in biology that argues that there are these ecologies around us that are not yet visible to us and not yet maybe known to us as the life forms that we are defining as the life forms depend on our understanding of biology and of science. And then another aspect that is characteristic to our work is that we are very much interested in pedagogy that is in the core of the artistic experience. So again, this has legacy with Joseph Boyce and it has legacy with pedagogical turn in art where, as Nomeda was also mentioning, where the artists positioning their work more as a learning environment or as a platform where the communities are taking over and have certain liberatory effect, perhaps, on the communities. So they could form their own autonomy and their own, we could say, independence from uh, whatever regimes of governmentality we can imagine. So it's certainly the right regimes of governmentality when we're talking about the public administration, but also when we, even if we're thinking of, you know, certain protocols that are, you know, designed about how we understand the environment. So engaging this younger generation allowed us to be way much more perhaps free and experimental, if you will, and play outside of those constraints. And even like proposing them almost like as a game, kind of like to engage the shadow biosphere to... Imagine. Yeah, to imagine together, right. And also this um, imagination, I think this is what we tried also to position as the provocation for the, for the planets, you know. So not only to work and engage the species that are known to us, but also to engage this imaginary biosphere that maybe it's already like lurking around us. It is just we don't see it, you know. So therefore, the Swamp Observatory was positioned as artistic slash scientific technology that allows us to, to see and experience, you know, the species and make connection with them. So when we're speaking about the future societies or the future settlements or the future of the humanity, this cannot be separated from all these other species and ecologists around us. So why not imagine the future society in kinship with those imaginary creatures? A term that's been popping up a lot recently is imagination infrastructure. And I, I think that's maybe somewhere where the role of the artist is, is really, really pertinent. You know, just this idea that our imaginations are not completely free to wander wherever we want we've been socialized and so having actors who are able to kind of break that open or provide provocations and to point out that there is an infrastructure within which our imaginations are operating i think that's yeah that's really valuable yeah absolutely yeah. and also some of the theorists like for example tj demos who is proposing eco fiction as a way to deal with this doomsday scenario of the anthropocene it's also you know trying to encourage artists to come up with the new vocabularies and new concepts, new parafictions, new ideas that could suggest the possibility for survival. And I think dealing with the climate crisis or, you know, this kind of like the dark, kind of like doomsday scenario, it requires in a way the opposite. And I'm not talking about beautification or the use of aesthetics kind of like to anesthetize humans. On the contrary, to come up with some radical propositions that can propose different scenarios that are playful and maybe hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. I think very much that, uh, lately how we have talked a lot about like crime crisis and biodiversity crisis. It is just like, oh, now we understand and things are just the end. But it's just the end of humans. And if we should say so, I mean, everything will continue. I think it's more that we have to create a new language actually to try to live in it. Because when I look at how that kind of language we have created affecting 
the younger generation, I can absolutely understand why they are reacting, saying, oh, no, that's nothing to do. We're leaving now. Mm. And I think that's one of the most serious things we have to understand when we try to think about creating a language. It's so complicated what's happening because there's so many parameters there's interacting, but how can we then create an image or images there start to interact with this new situation we're in in how we're creating the images? I think that's where artists are challenged right now. And that's one of the most difficult exercises for artists, I think. And that relationship between the language we have available to us and the scope of our imaginations, I think, is a really interesting one. Maybe also because we have to talk about something we don't know what is. So in that sense, we don't have to create any science fiction. It's just in front of us. But how do we then enter that situation? with a a language that can be used to communicate with. The final thing I wanted to ask about was this whole idea of legacy, which I guess anyway is an interesting question, but especially in the context of the climate crisis in a situation where the future, well, the present and the future is so uncertain, How do you guys feel about the idea of artistic legacy? Do you hope to have any sort of legacy? And if so, what? And how is that affected by the climate crisis and the fact that everything is in flux? And I suppose, is it still a relevant idea that artists should have some kind of legacy? Wow, I never thought in these terms. (laughs) You know, it's really funny because we often, maybe during the past years, you know, I could say often talking about artists being compost. And I was just like, as we were talking earlier, responding to your question, Katie, uh, I was looking at this uh, book that is called Steal This Book from 71 on counterculture. And um, and I think, you know, we often thinking of our work sort of like almost in these terms, like steal this work or or artists becoming a compost or their artistic ideas becoming a compost that could become someone else's um, um, food. food. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think it is also the scale in which you look and where do you look from, whether you look at it from the, like, let's say, art field perspective or you look uh, at it from the society perspective, or you look at it from a more a planetary, you know, aspect. So it it always depends on the scale where you look at. And I mean, it is nice, you know, when you do something what is kind of meaningful for society, and it leaves the mark, and it actually is inscribed somehow in the let's say history of the society. You feel like flattered when you made something like that. But at the same time, I think, you know, definitely we think a lot of being a compost. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was just looking for another word, substrate. Substrate, yes. Yeah. This American developmental biologist, Scott Gilbert, he was one of the very first ones to call himself we. And he used that with the understanding that uh, the human body contains less even human cells. You know, there are all these uh, different organisms that are thriving on what it constitutes the human body as a collective of uh, species that are all the time in a certain relationship and codependency with each other. And this is very humbling thought, you know, like to think that we are substrates. We are substrates to all other visible and invisible species. And if you look from that perspective also into our environment, I think it is very healthy. I think it is humbling. And it's also, I would argue, it's very realistic as well. When we were in Gotland, we learned like the entire island is a fossil and it gives us this deep time perspective. And once we started to look into the variety of the fossils that we have found, we encountered the one that is called Tortotubus, Tortotubus uh, fungi. It's perhaps the oldest fossil, but also its oldest life form that has 440 million years old known to humanity. 
And scientists are arguing that this Tortutubus mushroom helped to jumpstart life on the planet. So basically, it, it was the first one who started to produce compost, allowing all other plants and species and forms of life you know, to occur. So thinking in these terms, I think it is sobering to think of yourself as a substrate and to think of yourself as a compost. I think it is... Um, liberating. It is liberating, <laughs> yes. It's hopeful. To find out more about the work of Urbunus Studio, visit nugu.lt forward slash us. To learn more about Rika Luder's work, visit rikaluder.dk. That's R-I-K-K-E-L-U-T-H-E-R dot D-K. And check out balticartcentre.com for more information about Baltic Art Centre. That's centre spelt with an E-R. As we edge towards summer here in the Northern Hemisphere, we're going to be taking a bit of a break. Testing Grounds will be back with four more episodes at the end of August, so remember to subscribe to the podcast now if you haven't already, to make sure you don't miss it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Testing Grounds from the Nordic Alliance of Artists' Residencies on Climate Action. If you enjoy the podcast, please tell your colleagues and friends and leave us a review. This episode featured Helena Selder, Rika Luder, and Omeda and Gediminas Urbunas. It was produced by me, Katie Ravel. Our series music is by Loris S. Sarit, and our artwork is by Jagoda Sadowska. This episode also featured compositions by Mouse on Mars, originally created for the Swamp Observatory app, using samples made by students at the Athene School. Thanks also to Alex Mars, Charlotte Hetherington, Lena Kayla, Alexia Holt, Vibeka Kohler, Jakob Fabricius, Rose Tetgat, Helena Selder, Lisa Otagena, and even Mosbeck. The members of NARCA are Cove Park in Scotland, Sari Residence in Finland, Skafeld Art Centre in Iceland, Art Hub Copenhagen in Denmark, Narsak International Research Station in Greenland, Artica Svalbard in Norway, and Baltic Art Centre in Sweden. NARCA's initial three-year programme is generously supported by Kona Foundation and Nordic Culture Fund.